Hello, I am Julia Bushkova, and today is a very special day for me and for you because today um, I have a real medical professional here with me to address very important issues uh, for us musicians. Uh, so, first I will introduce my colleague here. It is Andra Sturzik. She is a certified hand therapist and occupational therapist with over 20 years of experience. She specializes, um, among other things, in athlete and musician injuries and conditions such as uh, tendon and nerve impairments and repairs, uh, tendinopathy, which means to say tendinitis, uh, of any sorts that uh, plagues us very often. And um, along with that, of course, she manages a lot more of upper extremity injuries and uh, professional and occupational conditions. And she's committed to lifelong learning, so she's constantly updating her professional expertise and does all kinds of research to be on the front edge of medical knowledge. So I'm very happy to have Andra Sturzik with us today. Hello, Andra. Hello, glad to be here. Wonderful. I'm very happy that we can ask her very important questions. So the first question would be um, about the so-called double-jointedness. Mm -hmm. So in the string world, we use this term to be double-jointed. Um, and I have a suspicion that maybe it is not called that way in the medical profession. Mm -hmm. So I would be curious to know what it really is, what this condition mm -hmm. is. And also, um, we know about benefits and problems that it causes mm -hmm. for us. Uh, but maybe you can tell us more from medical physiological standpoint about okay. this condition. So double jointed is definitely not a medical term, but I do ask my patients frequently, has anyone ever told you that you're double jointed? Because they often, that's how they perceive their condition. So double jointed, if you took it literally, would mean that someone had maybe double the joints that everybody else had, or they had double the motion, mm -hmm. and neither one of those are true. So what we call them in the medical community is either hypermobility or laxity. They're kind mm -hmm. of interchangeable terms. Mm -hmm. So what that means is someone has a joint that moves beyond the normal physiological anatomical limits of what a joint should move. So there's actually specific tests for it because there are some syndromes that actually, we see that a lot with them. So that's how you would get diagnosed was you would kind of go through these different tests for that. So I see quite a few people in the clinic who have hyperlaxity in their joints. Um, and that's definitely something that we always talk about when I'm kind of getting their history and their feedback because it leads you to be more prone to certain injuries. Oh, there are definitely benefits of being hypermobile for certain conditions, specifically athletes and musicians. Um, you see baseball players, when they throw and they pitch, they've got that extreme external rotation that nobody else in the world has. Um, you show me videos of violin players that do things with their hands that I would not consider to be normal. Um, and so it allows a person who has trying to do something at a very high skill level to do things that maybe the rest of the world can't do. I see. So does that make them more prone to be great at being athlete, you know, athletic in nature or musical in nature? Maybe. Um, it allows you to play in positions that the rest of us could not do. Mm -hmm. um, it allows um, for the ability to probably maybe do it for longer than most people because we know that as we age, hypermobility decreases. Mm -hmm. It's more prevalent when you're younger. It's more common in women. Um, mm -hmm. And there are certain races where it is also more common. So um, if you are already hypermobile, you might have a much longer career in the music mm -hmm. and athletic world because you stay more mobile for longer, whereas the rest of us are getting stiff and can't perform those motions anymore. Mm -hmm. So those are some of the benefits of being hypermobile. But there are quite a few drawbacks as well. So if you're hypermobile, that means that your joints are looser than they should be. And because that happens, things are moving that normally shouldn't be moving. So right. a lot of our body tissues, like ligaments, muscles, tendons, things of that nature, are to help provide stability to our joints. Um, and if you have joints that are very loose, 
Um, I like to think of it as if you take a whole bunch of bowling balls and you kind of lightly strap them in the back of your truck and then you go driving, they're going to kind of be contained, but they're also going to be moving all over the back of your truck. They're not really stable. So if you have ligaments or connective tissue that's loose, that means those bones and those joints are moving in ways that are not exactly stable. Mm -hmm. Another thing that kind of comes off of that is if you have bones that are running together in ways that they shouldn't, that can lead to degeneration, which can lead to arthritis. Oh, I see. Another issue with it, whenever you have more mobility that you should, is that it makes you a little bit more prone to injury. Things like tendonitis, for example, is a really common one that I see, where um, if you have tendons that are rubbing over bones that are unstable, they're getting a lot more friction. And so cre mm -hmm. friction creates heat, which creates inflammation, which causes pain. Oh, yeah. um, I'm trying to think of some of the other things that hypermobility does. Well, maybe we can then segue to our my next question, mm -hmm. specifically because it, I know it has to do with hypermobility, mm -hmm. of course. And um, that is certain positions of our fingers on the fingerboard. Mm -hmm. And here I have the violin I can show you. Um, so for instance, very common in the left hand, we'll start with the left hand. Mm -hmm. uh, very common in the left hand is the position of the pinky that is like this. Mm -hmm. So which basically is collapsing in here. And mine is not so bad because mm -hmm. I actually trained it already mm -hmm. for years playing. Now this one is much worse. So it can mm -hmm. go to this or even to this mm -hmm. way. So of course it's pretty terrible. Uh, but uh, some people have it here and some people even have it like, I can't even do it on this one, but some people have it collapsing there. Mm -hmm. So I know from my like teaching and performing mm -hmm. experience that not all the time, but uh, quite a few times, especially with growing musicians, mm -hmm. uh, that uh, doesn't allow as much need pressure mm -hmm. of the tip of the finger on mm -hmm. the string. Uh, would that be a correct thing from physiological thing to say that this is less pleasure here than if I put it like this? Yes, so this would be a better anatomical posture. Um, when I look at your hand and some of the positions that you've shown me, the thing I think that's important to know, and if you asked me this question before in the past is, is that technically a deformity? So there are certain deformities that I see that come from injuries. And so one of them is that one. So yes. you were showing me where the knuckle is bent and this joint is pretty straight and then this one's hyperflexed. Correct. So there's an injury that presents like this and they call it mallet finger. Um, there's another one that presents like this wow. that they call swan neck. That, that I have seen actually mm -hmm. on one of my students and it was on this finger. So okay, that yeah. also it can, can happen in any finger. Um, so mm -hmm. So the, the ability, you have the ability to go in and out of that posture. You have control of that. Mm -hmm. So I would say that you have functional stability of that joint. Um, or I might even say that you have a functional deformity because you can go in and out of that posture and mm -hmm. still maintain your normal hand motion. Whereas somebody who comes in and they've actually ruptured the tendon here, I would say they just have a deformity. Really? So you and I have talked before in the past about the fact that you know, how do people perform in these postures and are they okay and are they at risk for something happening down the road? I would say there is a risk because if you are continuously using your hand in that way mm -hmm. on a regular basis, yeah. then you're overstretching ligaments and things that are meant to keep the joint stable. But if you are going in and out of that posture and you can control it, there's a much lower risk of, of danger to your joint because you have the ability, you're stable enough and strong enough to control it. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, that's also something co that correlates with what I have observed mm -hmm. in the teaching, that some people definitely need to just relearn. Mm -hmm. I was one of them. When I was little, I had to relearn because my finger that was in this position, it would be, get stuck. It doesn't now anymore. Mm -hmm. But like on this one, you can see that if I do this, right. I have to use force. extreme force mm -hmm. and snap it out, which this is what, what this one was doing. So some of my students showed this particular things and mm -hmm. I said, you have to relearn how to put it that way. Mm -hmm. I call it supported, yeah. a supported way. What would you call it 
medically, I wonder. So when you showed me that posture, the first thing I thought of is that the person is using a very specific muscle, a large amount, say maybe 80% of the function is happening at this joint and yes. only 20% is happening mm -hmm. at this joint. At this joint. So a more protected posture would be what you're demonstrating. So there's slight bend at the knuckle, there's slight bend at this joint, and there's slight bend at the end. Mm -hmm. So now you're using three muscles I see. rather than the majority of one. So I it would be see. more like, you know, 30, 30, 30 rather than, you know, 80, 20. 80, 20. So you're keeping all of these joints more stable by providing a little bit of bend in all of them. And we also know that when a joint is in its extreme level of motion, it's at its most risk for getting injured. I see. So if okay. the finger is completely straight or the finger is completely bent, you're more at risk for injury. Makes sense. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, the next question that I would ask Andres Terzik um, is, so in another situation we encounter a lot of times uh, as teachers is um, a th improper in my opinion an improper thumb placement mm -hmm. so there have been uh, lots of schools actually violin schools uh, that we can read uh, about or we can read directions from the uh, exponents of those schools in print that the thumb should be placed at the nut okay and then from there the fingers go so I'm not sure if some teachers still go by this very old, in my opinion, outdated information where the thumb should be, um, or for any other reasons, but the thumb a lot of times finds its place close to the nut. And so therefore we are looking at this position mm -hmm. here. Okay, so here, and then the finger's gonna go up, upward from the thumb. So right this okay? okay so what I find in this position so now the thumb is back at the nut mm -hmm. that even me and I have my fourth finger trained if I put it like this I tend to go to an improper position of the pinky uh, and in order not to have it I have to bring the thumb in what I call is more natural position mm -hmm. like how it grows I say mm -hmm. okay and then my pinky is more readily supported so in other words I find from um, just violinistic perspective mm -hmm. that this placement of the thumb back at the nut uh, it compromises the function of fingers mm -hmm. it also creates in my uh, observation extra tension right here mm -hmm. you know because the people tend to squeeze and uh, it also negatively affects, uh, affects what we call uh, the stretch of the hand like if I need to reach. stretch reach mm -hmm. up exactly and so this for instance you know, that first mm -hmm. of all, this is improper. I have a lot of tension and I can't even reach the note of D, which is actually here. And if I go from here to there mm -hmm. with the thumb being in here mm -hmm. rather than in there, I can reach perfectly fine. So that's what I know from as a violinist. Mm -hmm. And I would like to ask your opinion. What is the medical, again, physiological perspective on that? So I could talk about the thumb for days. Um, well, you were t you were talking earlier about what is kind of optimal thumb position. Optimal thumb position is really whatever position your hand falls into when it's at rest. This is yeah. this is the best way for us to pinch mm -hmm. because our thumb is already right there by the index finger. It's out and away from our fingers, so that means we can grab things. If you have a really tight web space, you kind of end up with this kind of claw type situation. And when I watch you play, it's interesting because I see you. You kind of move in and out of this posture a lot Correct. and then sometimes I see quickly I can't even make my thumb do it you kind of fall into the mm -hmm. you know the hyper extended knuckle and the hyper flexed tip and so um, again this mimics a thumb deformity so if we have the thumb really close and this one um, is hyper extended and then the thumb goes like this or it can go back like that that's the more typical one that I see and the space right here is really tight mm -hmm. we want that thumb to be out further this little device won't help me do that very well but that would be ideal for you to have a little bit of bend again in all three of those joints um, there's a muscle that sits right here that is the third strongest muscle yes, yes. in the body mm -hmm. and so 
Wow. When you have your thumb in close all the time, this muscle can get really tight. And when it's tight, it's difficult for you to get your thumb out and away from your hand, which I'm sure you need a lot of thumb range in order right. to play your instrument. So you would want to keep this nice and loose, and you would want to have some good bend here rather than collapsing back like that. I think you showed me a famous person that kind of goes in and out of that thumb posture, and it's amazing to me that he can control it as well as he does. Um, obviously, he's practiced a lot yes. <laughs> to make that happen. So again, ideally, we prefer to have a little bit of bend in all of those joints, and we'd like to have a nice open space in here. Open space, mm -hmm. okay. So then, um, if we again take violin and look in here, mm -hmm. right, and um, where the thumb, so that will be an improper thumb position, and you know, not beneficial, let's put mm -hmm. it this way. And this is a much better one because this is where it wants to be, correct? Right. So, um, will the, will you be then supporting this this position? For uh, me, at least for me, for because you? mine, yeah, mine, mine goes, mine grows, I call it grows. Uh, yeah, pretty far. I know that some people's thumbs would be, for instance, more here. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then for them, I would say, well, you need probably to be just where you are. Mm -hmm. As you said, as when our hand folds, we just want to be where it naturally mm -hmm. folds. Right. So if I look at your thumb, you have a little bit of a bend there, a little yes. bit of a bend there, and a little bit of a bend there. That's that's perfect. That's good. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then, okay, wonderful. So that uh, is our next important <laughs> question. Um, Another um, question, sort of still, I mean, not sort of, but actually relating to the thumb. In your opinion, I know that you're not a violinist, mm -hmm. but in your opinion, uh, so when, uh, if we take away what I said earlier mm -hmm. about certain old schools actually suggesting that the thumb should be placed here, mm -hmm. and I, as, a, as a professional, I know why it was suggested back then, but I don't think it's, it's valid, should be valid today. In any case, so if we take away that information, mm -hmm. uh, and let's say somebody explains, you know, that your thumb should be comfortable and so mm -hmm. on, and meanwhile the student still ends up having the thumb there. Mm -hmm. From medical perspective, physiological perspective, do you think there is something that may be causing that aside of instruction? Um, mm -hmm. I, my hunch, again, absolutely mm -hmm. my hunch is that uh, since on violin, we also have this situation. When you first take violin, you're like this. Okay. And my hand is far away, so uh, from the fingerboard. Mm -hmm. So the first finger being long, of course, will reach, and the second will reach, and the third will reach, and the fourth cannot reach at all. Mm -hmm. So what we teach our students early on is that you need to turn the hand here, mm -hmm. so the, for the fourth finger to reach. So, which is actually not an easy thing to do, especially mm -hmm. for beginners. And in my thinking, it may be is that the thumb kind of leads that turn. Mm -hmm. Like when we turn, mm -hmm. like with my right hand, that it just kind of leads it. And so maybe some people, when they are in the process of adjusting here, maybe they do it with the help of the thumb and therefore mm -hmm. thumb gets kind of stuck back and mm -hmm. keeps being it. What is your take on this? Uh, might it be why uh, this placement of the thumb happens or maybe something else is there from a medical standpoint? The first thing I think of is that forearm rotation, we call it supination, like you're holding a bowl of soup. I don't have full supination. If I worked at it, I could get better supination, but I don't. But I am a little bit more mobile in my wrist than I probably should be. And so what happens is when you reach the end range of the forearm range of motion, then you have the carpal range of motion. And the thumb, as you said, it leads the way and it's pulling. So it's pulling this carpal row mm. over. So it looks like, if you just look at my hand, mm -hmm. it looks perfectly flat. Yes. But if you look at my forearm, my yeah. forearm is not. And so I would say, you were talking about what might lead someone to that. I would say if the student has tight forearm rotation, maybe mm -hmm. they start to compensate with the wrist rotation because mm -hmm. that's where they can get it easily. Whereas rather than working on getting greater forearm rotation, wow. they're actually compensating with their wrist, which is more lax than the forearm. So basically what we're looking at is this. Mm -hmm. so, so that would be the forearm rotation, mm -hmm. correct? That would be, and that one, 
and then doing them more. Right. So, this so is if the, you do yeah. that again, real quick, so rotate for me now. Further rotate from the wrist, so you oh. can see how much further you your yes, hand is I now further beyond flat. Correct. This is flat, but you've gained even more rotation from right. the wrist level because yes. you're a little bit loose in the wrist. I see. So those students who are maybe beginners and who can't quite comprehend, maybe they're young. Mm -hmm. uh, younger usually, as you mentioned before, are more mobile, mm -hmm. right? But maybe young person sometimes is not just not understanding that that's what needs to be rotated. Mm -hmm. And they just think, oh, hand should be right. rotated. And that's why, okay, that's quite illuminating actually. <laughs> Yes, for the so first the time in my life, I now realize why so many people do it in their hand rather than in the forearm. Mm -hmm. So the, then the key would be uh, the teachers who teach the, mm -hmm. for the first time, you know, that rotation, they really should focus on the forearm rotation. Right, they right? should examine their student to see how mobile they are and where is the rotation really coming from. Is it coming from the mm -hmm. forearm or is it coming from the wrist or is it both? Um, and then mm -hmm. teaching the students stretches to improve their forearm rotation and then even further beyond that, strengthening the muscles that create forearm rotation so that wow. they can maintain that posture well for longer periods of time as they play. That is fantastic. I think I will ask Andra to provide me with some exercises, mm -hmm. some stretch and strengthening exercises for the forearms. Yes, yeah. that would be very helpful. So previously we talked about one of the issues with violin players is that lack of forearm rotation. And we talked about are there ways that you can increase that amount of forearm rotation without causing damage to the wrist joints. So um, oftentimes with patients, I will find that when I teach them exercises for forearm rotation that they often cheat by using their shoulders. So when you perform exercises for forearm rotation just in general, you want to make sure that your elbow is near your ribs. And what can happen if I'm working on forearm rotation, if I'm here, I can cheat and make it look like my forearm is rotating by just moving my elbow. Nothing is happening. Nothing is happening in my hand, but it looks like it is because I'm cheating with my elbow. So you want the elbow close to the body. So the first thing that I'm going to show you is a stretch to try and gain more forearm rotation into supination. And what you're going to do is you're going to take your fingers of your other hand and you're going to reach around on the thumb side and grasp your forearm. And then you're going to take your thumb and you're going to come around on the top like this. And what you're going to do is you're going to pull with your fingers while you're lifting with your thumb. So I'm pulling and rolling. And as you can watch my hand, you can see that my hand becomes more palm up this way. So the best thing to do is to hold that for 20 to 30 seconds at a time and do it multiple times. The thing that I don't want you to do is I don't want you to grab at the wrist and do the same thing because the wrist is inherently an unstable joint. There are no muscles that cross the wrist, just tendons controlling the muscles. So you don't want to overstretch these small little bones and decrease the amount of stability that you have at the wrist level. We're trying to get that motion from the forearm, not from the wrist. So that's a stretch for that. Another one that I like to do is, you can use a band for this one, you're going to hold it with your thumbs pointing towards each other, again, elbows at your ribs, and then you're going to roll your forearms so that they're up like this, nice and slow. So no quick snaps, letting the band do the work. Slow and controlled, trying to get your palms to go up and holding it for a second or two at the end range. So that will increase your strength of the muscles that create that forearm rotation. And finally, one of my favorite exercises to do is with a hammer. You can also use a mallet. So I think I found this at the dollar store for a whole dollar. So you can, they're not very expensive. Um, this is a larger hammer. Um, and so sometimes this might be too much initially when you're starting out, but just like in baseball, when you choke up on the grip, you can also choke up on the handle of your hammer. The closer you are to the middle of the hammer, the less of a stretch or pull you're going to feel. The further you are down at the very end, the more intensity that you're going to feel with the exercise. So it doesn't matter if it's pointing this way or if it's pointing this way, but what you're going to do is again, you're going to place your elbow on your ribs. You're going to grab a hold of this and for strengthening you're going to roll down so that your palm is facing the floor and then you're going to roll over slowly so that your palm is facing up and as you do that the weight of the hammer is pulling your arm into more forearm rotation hold it for a few seconds and then you're just going to come back the other direction just like this you're going to alternate these 
An alternative to that that you can use for increasing the amount of rotation that you have without working on strength is you can use this as a stretch. So you can get into the position that you're working on and then just try and hold it there for a prolonged period of time, 20 seconds, 30 seconds, a minute. Again, you're trying to avoid pain. This one can kind of build. So you have to be careful. If you start to notice your pain is getting higher, usually I always tell my patients, keep your pain on the pain scale of zero being no pain and 10 being emergency room pain. You wanna keep it about a three, so three or less. And you would just sit and hold this. You would feel that stretch. And then you would repeat this about two or three times to get maximum benefit. We know that as time passes, the tissues will relax a little bit more because they get used to the pressure. So you can use this effectively to go in both directions, depending on which one you have more resistance to tightness in. Again, I would like to thank you, wonderful Andra Sturzik, for her expertise and the time that she spends with me uh, and with you and for all your wisdom and all the knowledge that you share with us so graciously. Thank you, I love educating people.